Hey, Brandon. Hey, Fabio. How are you? Good. I have a tough one for us today. Oh, boy. I Well, you know, this one, I'm not even sure this one's normal. I, 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 I give up. I, I say we go get Dr. Kaplan. I, I think he may know something about this one. Okay. Oh, there he is, actually. Oh, hi. I happen to be looking in. <laughs> This is a problem with Zoom. It's not secure. Well, welcome anyway. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome, Peter. You're our very first guest. I'm super excited. A little bit nervous, too. Yeah, Me, too. He's, he's very mean. I, that's his reputation. <laughs> All right, you're driving. I gave you a control. So we're just uh, shotgunning, and we'll just ask you questions. Do you, wanna, do you want us to give you a little history, like the age or what's wrong with the patient? Well, um, why was the EEG requested? Yeah, I think it was for uh, alter mental status. <laughs> right. Yep. Pretty specific. Well, uh, I can see a very interesting clinical feature here, which is the one, and can you see my arrow? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So there is a certain morphology here. Mm -hmm. It's a paroxysm of a sudden burst lasting about 300 milliseconds. It seems to have, in many of these derivations, either three phases or two phases. Let me go to the topmost derivation where there's an initial uh, small rounded upgoing first phase, and then there's a, uh, a reasonably steep descending second phase. Uh, and the third phase go, ascends and then goes slowly back to the baseline. And if you were to calculate the duration of this phenomenon on this waveform, you'd see it ended about there and it started about there. So it's a minimum of about half a second, in which case, if this went in couplets or triplets, it would be probably no faster than two hertz. The maximum of this wave really uh, often, if you look at it in other uh, pages, and we'll see that presently, is in the frontocentral region, not the frontopolar region. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, when this occurs, it occurs simultaneously and synchronously bilaterally. But there seems to be a certain lag in each of these waveforms in the sense that right here, it occurred a little bit earlier, the third derivation, than in the second derivation, which is about the same as in the first. Mm -hmm. So there appear appears here to be a postero anterior lag. Hmm. Even in the same waveform, you might see an antero posterior lag. Here you might see it as well again. Here's a good example where you see in the frontocentral a much better formed waveform than in the frontopolar. Hmm. So these bilateral synchronous morphologies uh, were originally described by Bickford and Butt in 1955 uh, and by uh, another investigator also in the 50s, and they termed them wa triphasic waves because they had three phases. Mm. Now, the question was, were these an epileptic phenomenon? And back then, the concept of epileptic was that it pertained to being in a seizure, predisposing to a seizure, or representing part of a seizure. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the patients that they looked at, I think there were about 12 patients, all had what we would call now delta or altered mental status or what they called an encephalopathy. And they went back and found that the patients who were referred who had this EEG pattern had hepatic insufficiency. And later on, they were able to measure the ammonia levels and make some correlation between ammonia and this morphology, typically that of a raised ammonia. But then as time went on, they found that there were patients with these morphologies who lacked a high ammonia. Mm -hmm. and, but, and they began collecting all sorts of other uh, systemic problems that went along with it. So that now there are probably well over 30 to 50 to 60 associations, because it's very difficult to say causation when you do a single uh, case. You can do perhaps causation on a single patient if you do a challenge, re-challenge test mm -hmm. with perceived offending agent, bringing us to the concept that these may be generated by patients with toxicity. So if you look at the family of toxic and metabolic problems that predispose to this, I would start with 
systems failures. And the first one is an organ system failure. So we mentioned hepatic failure, but then they found that renal failure did it. Endocrine failure, such as high glucose, low glucose, high sodium, low sodium, but not, let's say, potassium. Mm -hmm. Failure can even do it. Um, we did endocrine respiratory, so hypoxia can do it and hypercapnia can do it. And then family toxicities, increasingly, there are ones that resemble this superficially in the sense that they have two or three phases and that they are uh, bilateral and synchronous, but usually they are briefer and spikier, sometimes asymmetric and sometimes asynchronous. And that would be from toxicity from baclofen or lithium or phosphamide. And now what we're seeing is with the increasing use of toxic agents in patient with mild renal insufficiency, you can have a spillover effect of things such as uh, Lyrica or gabapentin producing these sorts of waves in patients with borderline or frankly abnormal renal dysfunction. Mm. Uh, but it's worth knowing that in fact, you don't have to have frank by the book renal dysfunction. You can have borderline, particularly in the elderly and particularly in women. And the most common offending agent that I encounter now is cefepime. So that would be a typical toxic cause of this phenomenon. Now, more recently, the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society promulgated a classification system led by Larry Hirsch that you can find in a reference in which each of the elements of an EEG, meaning the background activity, how it presents, how it evolves, whether it's bilateral, unilateral, focal, um, into different monikers. And one of them is periodic discharges, meaning an episode or rather an episodic appearance of a morphology deemed to be a discharge because originally it was allied with the concept that it might be epileptic or epileptic form. And I still use those terms, more epileptic form, even though they have formally fallen out of research classifications by Larry Hirsch's ACNS. Mm -hmm. This became part of the generalized periodic discharge family. Mm -hmm. Generalized periodic discharge family is really just a way of describing when, where, how, and, uh, and possibly then how it evolves. Peter, so I think you mentioned that it could either be biphasic or triphasic, but we're still calling them triphasic. Is that is that really it? Could it just be yeah. biphasic and still be triphasic? That's, that's Larry. Yeah, it's a bit, problem, isn't it? it's paradoxical. You see, because the first ones they described, they were dealing with four channel machines or two channel machines. Mm -hmm. Then they were using unipolar or referential. Mm -hmm. Okay, in fact, to look at what they used to call triphasic waves, you're supposed to look at it with a referential montage. I actually use bipolar for virtually everything. Mm. All right. Now here you'll see uh, that we're able to see because with a bipolar, as you know, one subtracts from the next. So it's a much better localizer of activity mm. as long as they don't have shared electrical uh, content. Mm. So you have a larger, uh, bigger potential, it means that the fall off between the two electrode inputs is greater, and that's what gives it a higher voltage. Mm -hmm. There's a greater uh, fall off of voltage near the central head regions than in the frontal head regions. And you can see that also on the unipolar. If anyone finds triphasic waves in, in any age between 15 and 25, let me know, write it up, send it to the journal. We, you know, because the question is, why would someone who's 18 not have triphasic waves? Why, why, why? What facilitates the appearance of triphasic-like morphologies is white matter disease. So you can have a lot of white matter disease um, and have very little in the way of toxic metabolic insult and see them, hmm. All right? So, um, you know, there are, you can have a bit of uremia, a bit of cefepime and out they come. Mm -hmm. white matter disease, whereas you need a lot more toxicity if you have an intact looking structural brain without atrophy. So you, you, what was the challenge? It was to find one in someone? Under the age of 22. 20. Okay, under the age of 22. All right, I will, the gauntlet is thrown down. I'm going to try to find one. But uh, is, it, is it cheating if we look for someone who has a, you know, a severe... No, you must. You, okay. you should. <laughs> I asked the King's College, Nasha.
Ah. Right? And she's with, it was a lecture we were giving there, and they had all the pediatric people, and they have a huge EEG. She said, sure, I'll ask them all. Mm -hmm. um, I never heard back, so I then emailed them again, and they said, you know, it's funny. And I asked the president of the British Society. They hadn't seen it. I asked my French colleagues. They don't have them. Wow. And I asked the Hopkins people downtown. So no one has found me a triphasic wave under the age of 20. Okay. It is a challenge. Peter is taking uh, whoever finds it uh, for dinner. If you want me to spout on anything else in the future, I'm game. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, be ready. We're get, we're having you back. All right. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, thanks again.